So, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, 20th, which is a two and a zero uh, home gemology webinar supported by Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation, and co hosted by the one and only, really handsome Edward Johnson directly from London. Um, so uh, this, this uh, today we will do a repetition of a webinar that we just offered a couple of months ago uh, during strict lockdown and amethyst was one of the first topics and because so many people ask for a repetition here we are but because we have done these webinars for so long let me just browse you one by one uh, all the themes that have been entertained uh, the first was emerald, then was precious corals with uh, Vincenzo Liberino, then it was uh, Brazilian diamonds, uh, the, a perspective from the 18th century jewelry, and then amethyst on the 21st of March. We are doing it again with a little bit of a, of a twist, not exactly the same. René Lalique, uh, it was quite uh, popular this one, and uh, a gemological perspective, not an artist perspective. And then natural pearls, and we had Adi Alfardan from Dubai um, telling us stories about his family collection of natural pearls and what is to be a pearl trader these days. Colored diamonds with Dr. Ed Louise Gayou directly from Paris. This webinar was terrific. It was showing us the science be behind diamond colors. Then it was an overview over ruby. And then we had the one and only Vincent Pardieu uh, speaking about field gemology which is his field of expertise, as most of you know. Again, we did a repetition on emeralds, then a very broad look, possibly out of the box view over diamonds, not the regular stuff. And then we had again, Vincenzo Liverino from, from uh, Torre del Greco in Italy, but he was broadcasting directly from his museum. So we had like a guided tour to his fantastic coral museum in Torre del Greco. Then we had from Melbourne, Australia, Damien Cody um, teaching us uh, about uh, precious opal. Then directly from the Museo Nacional de Arte Antiga, the um, National Museum of Antique Art here in Lisbon, Luisa Penalva, she's the curator, and she was handling the jewels from the collection and sharing those with us live. It was an exciting moment, that one. And then we had Dr. Edward Liu from Hong Kong addressing and discussing nomenclature issues about Jedite Jade. And then a simple one on famous pearls, then a repetition of the Brazilian diamonds in the 18th century jewelry. Then we had Dr. Jack Ogden on um, the early days of a sapphire uh, production. And last week we had cultured pearls, a broad overview over saltwater cultured pearls. And today we have amethyst. So today's topic is on amethyst and uh, we will cover not that many things, but we will cover etymology, which is the origin of the word and some interesting things are to be said about the origin of the words uh, amethyst. And also we will uh, discuss a little bit of the lore, the beliefs um, around the material, history and occurrences because the history of the use of the material has a little bit to do, if not a lot, to the uh, actually uh, geographical occurrences that have been, were discovered throughout the ages. And also we will illustrate all this talk with nice minerals and pieces of art because uh, as happens with uh, some materials that their market value is not like, wow, like diamonds or rubies or sapphires or emeralds, when you have lower uh, valued or lower priced materials, if you want to add value, you use art, you use lapidary skills, and you use jewelry skills. And you will see absolutely fabulous pieces of jewelry and cutting styles and even carvings and sculptures using amethyst. That's a way of adding significant value to a material that otherwise can be considered not as valuable as tourmalines, aquamarines, or the other stuff. And because this is a home gemology, and today we will have a little bit of gemology, a little bit of um, synthetics and imitations and tips on how to distinguish between the, both of them. So on the origin of the word, 
This is debatable, but the majority of the references, they advocate that amethyst comes from the Greek amethystus, sorry about my pronunciation, that basically stands for non-drunken, because there was this belief that if you, for instance, if you had wine on a glass of amethyst, you wouldn't get drunk, intoxicated. I have done the test. I, I think I will insist, but it doesn't work. It hasn't worked so far, so maybe you don't try if you wish. Another thing is, because the material is um, related to non-intoxication, maybe if you have a nice drink on this amethyst bathtub, this is crazy bathtub, maybe you might not even get drunk as well, or if you do your sangria inside of it, but this is crazy. This is just to show you a nice, a nice crazy bathtub made in, made in Florence with amethyst. The thing is, uh, mythology associates uh, the Bacchus, which is Dionysius, it's the same divinity, to amethyst, the god of wine related to amethyst. And there is a nymph called Methe that she's also connected, that she's the nymph of, uh, of drunkenness. She's also connected with amethyst. So in Greek mythology, uh, the amethyst is, has been always connected with wine. For those that like biblical studies or Judaica or the Pentateuch, uh, in the breastplate of the high priest that you can see on the book of uh, the Exodus, the ninth stone, which is Achlama, sorry about my pronunciation, is amethyst. One interesting thing about the breastplate and the materials that are reportedly on the breastplate is today when we read the Bible or when we read the, uh, the Torah, we read the, uh, the stones as they were translated into modern language. But we know that this book was written thousands of years ago. So we must uh, understand that the stones that are described must be stones that were available at the time of writing. So when you read on the description of the breastplate that there was an amethyst, okay, makes sense. There was lapis lazuli, it makes sense. Uh, carnelian, it makes sense. But if you read diamond, which is yalom, it doesn't make that much sense. It's a translation issue. Israel Elizieri, uh, uh, he used to be president of the ICA many years ago. He wrote a nice article for the International Geological Conference Proceedings in 1987, if my memory doesn't fail me, discussing precisely this, which is the actual identities or the discussion of what would be um, possible identities of the stones, of the breastplate, of the high priest in the Exodus. So, very interesting discussion, and he, uh, if you source it on the internet, you might find it not very easy to find this one. Israel Elizieri is the name of the geologist and the gem dealer, by the way, and he produced this fantastic scientific study on the stones of the breastplate of the high priest. Also in Catholic world, actually, I don't know if Anglicans, uh, it's, uh, it's the same in Great Britain, but the ring of bishops, uh, traditionally, up until the Vatican the Second Concilium, I don't know the name in English, uh, bishops used to wear rings, special rings. And they, they, they could use gemstones for those rings. And since the seventh century, that the stone connected with bishops has been amethyst. And why? Possibly because when you have purple, when we were students in high school or even kindergarten, if we didn't have a purple, purple pen, we, if we had a blue pen and a red pen, we just mix it together and we get purple. And in amethyst, we also have purple that can be understood as red from the blood of Christ and blue, which is the color of heaven, color of the sky. So you, you put them together and then you have the purple of, um, of bishops. And also, um, it's unavoidable to speak about exoterica when we, when we address uh, uh, gem materials, especially quartz varieties, and amethyst is a quartz variety. So very popular among exoterica. 
And uh, of course, it was one of the Cleopatra's favorite stones. It was also um, Cleopatra, she liked uh, emeralds and she liked pearls. I mean, she liked everything. But actually, it was Queen Alexandra from Great Britain, favorite color. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's interesting for Great Britain. Look at what is written on your screen. And if you read it, like prevents drunkenness, protects against spell, helps while approaching a king as a supplicant. Very handy today, we, you meet kings uh, occasionally. And wars of hail and locusts. You read it and you think, mm, that was taken from uh, an exoteric uh, website. No, it was written 2000 years ago by Pliny the Elder. So this kind of beliefs that sometimes we see them replicated in today's market for exoterical energetic stones, all those beliefs, they have a root, and sometimes we go to mythology or we go to the, uh, this pre-medieval um, beliefs that were uh, actually born uh, with, with the Romans or even earlier with the Greeks. Just as a curiosity, um, uh, amethyst is the birthstone of February, and uh, it was a favorite of uh, St. Valentine's. So I don't know the story uh, connecting uh, St. Valentine with Amethyst, but it happens that Valentine's, which is the Valentine's Day, uh, Amethyst is connected with that. So if you sometimes, uh, if, you don't, if you cannot afford the diamond on Valentine's Day, go, go, go for an Amethyst, it's much more affordable sometimes. So let's dig a little bit about the geology or mineralogy of Amethyst. Amethyst is a variety of quartz, and quartz is just the second most abundant mineral on the lithosphere. What is a lithosphere? Imagine that the planet is an orange, and you have the peel of the orange, which is the lithosphere. It's the, the outer shell, if you want to call it that way. I don't want to be very specific. And it's the most, the second most abundant on the lithosphere, among more than 3,500 minerals. So uh, we have thousands of minerals and quartz is number two. By the way, number one, it's like a group, it's a feldspar group. If you like mineralogy and what is the most abundant mineral on the whole planet, that's bridgmanite. Maybe you say bridgmanite, what the hell is bridgmanite? Well, it's a silicate that um, actually lives on the mantle, on the on the, on the layer of the planet just below the lithosphere, just below the crust. So it, it, there is a lot of bridgmanite around, so it's the most abundant mineral on Earth. And if you study diamonds, you know bridgmanite because it's a very common inclusion in some very deep diamonds. And as you know, diamonds can come from um, below 700 kilometers up. So it's an interesting thing. So, but let's forget about diamonds. Um, quartz is a very simple mineral, if you can call it a simple thing. It's only composed of two chemical elements, silicon and oxygen, both quite abundant in the upper part of the planet. So it's only natural that we see a lot of silica, which is, which is the, uh, the, this chemical composition, on, on the uh, Earth's surface. Of course, silica, when it gets together in the form of quartz, then we have quartz, but there are many forms of silica, quartz is one of them. And it is so abundant, quartz, that we see it, for example, in many rocks. And one of the rocks where you can actually see with your naked eye, you can spot uh, quartz grains, it's in granite. Think about the name granite, grain. It's a rock made out of grains. That's why you call it a granite. And when you look at the gray things on your screen, those chaps, are quartz. The pink ones are feldspar, the black ones are actually mica. And uh, when you look at granite, the gray stuff is always quartz. So you have a lot of quartz in granite. In other stones, and I just show you this just because it's a beautiful thing, uh, for those of you that collect minerals, you know that pegmatites, granitic pegmatites, sometimes they can grow large crystals, beautiful crystals, and quartz is usually one of them, and that you can see here on this beautiful uh, specimen, famous one, it's called the tourmaline candelabra, uh, it sits on the uh, Smithsonian Institution, has 
some blue cap tourmalines from the Pala mine in California, and it's over some nice crystals of quartz. So quartz, it's among mineral collectors, you see quartz everywhere. Where you also can see quartz, if you decide to travel to the Algarve and have a nice summer over there, it's quite safe actually, you look at the, uh, at the, um, this uh, Arriba, oh, now my English is over. What's the name of those cliffs? And those cliffs are made of sandstone, and that sandstone is sand. And this kind of sand is actually made up of quartz mostly. And even the uh, beach sand on continental beaches, I mean, not in Hawaii, maybe not in the Azores, and definitely not in, in, in reef coral islands like the French Polynesia, for example, but on continental beaches, most of the sand that you see are quartz grains which shell with other minerals. But as you can see here, the transparent shafts, those are quartz. If you live in Rio de Janeiro, you go to the Praia da Urca and, and the sand is transparent, lovely grains of quartz. It's one of the, my favorite sands ever. It's the Praia da Urca in Rio de Janeiro. Quartz is so important that there is even in Portugal, a museum in Viseu. Viseu is a small town in the interior of the country, uh, two and a half hours driving from Lisbon, that is only dedicated to quartz. And, uh, and th the idea of having this quartz is a gentleman that has my name. It wasn't me. I mean, I can say it's me because the name is the same, but it was my dad. He used to be director of the National History Museum here in Lisbon. And he had this idea of, uh, of um, honoring quartz as a, as a really important uh, mineral, and it made, he made this uh, museum in Viseu. So just uh, uh, honoring my father, which is nice. And uh, quartz, as we saw, we've seen in granites, in sand, in the beach, it's everywhere, so it's very abundant. But, and this is important, only on very rare occasions does quartz have enough qualities of color transparency to be used as a gemstone. A little bit like football players or cricket players. Um, there, there is thousands of them, but only a few go to the Premier League. Only a few have quality to be like, wow, good players. The same with quartz. It's very abundant, but only in very rare occasions do they have qualities to be called a precious stone. And please don't say semi-precious stone. That's a misnomer that hasn't been used for decades in our nomenclature. They are not semi-precious stones. Every stone is precious. Uh, now I remember Monty Python song, but doesn't have to do with, with precious stones, but every stone is precious. And, um, and uh, every stone is a gemstone in, in the jewelry industry, of course. It's so abundant quartz that it can occur in many, many textures, in many colors. And we can divide quartz actually in two types of universes, if you wish. We have the microcrystalline varieties where you can actually individualize each and every crystal like amethyst, citrine, rock crystal. And then you have the microcrystalline varieties where you cannot separate individually by eye the individual crystals. And then you have all the agates, onyx, carnelian, what have you. And all of those names, they are variety names. And it's a, quite a mess if you want to understand them all. Maybe we should deserve a webinar just on quartz varieties to, click, to clarify nomenclature issues. But today, it's only the simplest one, which is amethyst. And amethyst is the purple or violet variety of quartz. And the reason it is purple has to do with the mechanism. Most amethyst has to do with this. If it has iron 3+, plus, which is a type of iron, of oxidized uh, iron of uh, iron, if it, is, it has iron 3+, plus, and if it, has, it was subjected to natural or artificial irradiation, that iron, turns three plus to four plus, and then start the four plus starts reacting with the oxygen. With, and there is a one thing called intervalence charge transfer, 
that absorbs energy in such a way that the rock crystal colorless turns purple. That's the color mechanism that has been known for decades for amethyst. So it's a natural irradiation that causes the color of most amethyst. Maybe you didn't know that. So history, so amethyst is a very old gemstone, okay? Has been used for millennia. It's not as old as pearls, not as old as shell, maybe not as old as jade, turquoise, or lapis lazuli, but it's quite old. Uh, and it's a transparent gem material, uh, one of the oldest transparent gem materials. So this is a, a almost 4,000 years necklace uh, with inscriptions, quite interesting one. And the uh, occurrences, there are, I mean, uh, amethyst occurs basically everywhere, but on on old jewelry, the old sources of amethyst, on the literature, we encounter some in Europe, like in the Saxony or in Auvergne in France. We can also find in the Middle East, especially in Egypt, but also in, in India, also in Sri Lanka. So amethyst, you can spot it in uh, textbooks going on those areas, but basically it occurs everywhere. And it was not that common up until the 18th century, as we will see. So we occasionally we find amethyst in antique jewelry prior to the 18th century, uh, like on this reliquary that you can visit on the Portuguese museum. You see one amethyst there, one another amethyst over there, I think. It doesn't matter if I get it this wrong, because we cannot see that white. But on this one, on the British Museum, you can see clearly, oh, my voice, sorry. You can see clearly an amethyst over there. On the 18th century, what does it happen? Because there is a change going on on the 18th century on two, uh, two stages in the 18th century. When the Portuguese found gold in Brazil in the late 17th century, and then diamonds in the early 18th century, Everyone was looking at the ground, looking for gold and diamonds, and eventually some other cholera gemstones were discovered, like chrysoberyl, like topaz in Ouro Preto, but also amethyst in Minas Gerais. And then amethysts that were not that common in Europe started to arrive in Europe in numbers that were new to jewelry trade in, in that time. And we start seeing jewelry pieces like this ones, like you, you are seeing on your screen with an amount of amethyst that is considerable. But interesting enough, sometimes amethyst didn't have a very strong saturated color. And one, one subterfuge that they encountered to make it look better was to put a, a colored foil back behind the stone painted red so the stone could look better. But they even went further. When look at this aura, this uh, sacred image aura, and when you look at the color of the amethysts, especially not on this rim, but here on this flower, look at the color not in the center of the stone, but around, in the rim, look at the rim. And we can actually see that maybe the center is essentially the same color, but the rim, the color varies. And this is an indicator that we do have a colored foil bag working on this closed setting, demonstrating a few things. First, amethyst was abundant, but maybe not that abundant in the sense that you, it was not very easy to source hundreds of stones all of the same color because the color and the hue could vary from stone to stone so you needed to have something behind to make it look better and the other thing is maybe those guys on the 18th century late 18th century on this case they liked not monochromatism but they didn't like color variation that much so they used that subterfuge the colored foil bag to make sure every stone would appear in the same color. So it's a nice thing to look at on the amethyst from the 18th century. Also on the 18th century, which is the other part of the influence uh, of the 18th century in amethyst is in the Ural, in the, sorry, in Russia. We'll go to that. In Russia, uh, amethyst were also discovered in the 18th century. 
and the quality of those amethysts was absolutely amazing. And curiously, in, in Europe, we call them Siberian amethysts. And I have no idea why, because actually, the place where amethysts were found was not in Siberia, was in the Urals, in an area where many occurrences of amethyst were found in Mursinka. Sorry about my Russian pronunciation. And so in Mursinka, you did find a lot of uh, amethyst in the Urals, which is, it's not Siberia, has nothing to do with Siberia at all. So to call Siberian amethyst to, to the traditional Uralian Russian amethyst is absolutely wrong. It's a misnomer, but I mean, it's, it's a trade name that stick, um, but it's what it is. Siberian amethysts are not from Siberia. That's a, a good takeaway of today. And in, uh, in many um, royal houses around Europe, we do see a lot of amethysts from, I was about to say Siberia, from Russia being used on tiaras, for example, on late 19th century tiaras, like this lovely one uh, that, uh, that is uh, being, now it's held in the, in, the, in the Sweden Royal House, a lovely amethyst and lovely princesses, by the way. Everything changed again in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, with the discovery of massive, I underscore massive, deposits of amethyst in the uh, Rio Grande do Sul state in southern Brazil and in the neighboring area, which is Artigas in Uruguay. So on that area, basaltic origin amethysts, they were found by the time. And those chaps, they did make a difference also in European jewelry. That's why we see a lot of uh, circa 1820 um, sets like this one that you see on your screen using Southern American uh, amethysts. And we see a lot of quartz, of purple quartz in the 1820 to 1830 French or English jewelry, just like this one. And for all that matter, also in Brazilian jewelry and Portuguese jewelry, we see a lot of it. And this one's, the quantity was really huge, so they, those guys made a huge difference. That's from that area that this big geodes, this big decorative amethyst come from. So if you travel to the New York, you see the American Museum of Natural History, you see that huge geode about, I don't know, four meters high, it's, it's a gigantic one. And we start seeing amethyst being artistically uh, carved and artistically um, polished, not only as faceted stones, but also as seals, like this one, as carvings, like you see here on this beautiful two carvings, one from the Albion Art Institute. It's an absolutely lovely one. But over the years, other amethyst deposits uh, were discovered, and I'm not going to address each and every one of them. Uh, you have Morocco, you have uh, Rwanda, lovely amethysts by the way we have of course zambia one of the main uh, suppliers and sometimes with stones of a considerable size and lovely color and also northern america mexico you have you i mean a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, sources of amethyst are have been uh, identified today even mozambique uh, madagascar i mean so many it's basically everywhere to be honest so amethyst is a a rather common gem material, but uh, when it's carved and cut in a special way, it's a special gem material, make no mistake. One thing that probably you don't know, some of you know, of course, is when you look at amethyst, you have two types. You have the blue type and you have the red type. So if you are in England, you have the Chelsea and you have the Liverpool. Not a good joke, or Manchester City, Manchester United kind of colors so it's uh, some people like the blue some people like the red so you have two kinds of colors or two kinds of uh, secondary tones 
that people appreciate. And it's just a question of personal taste that some people like the blues. I personally like the blues. That's uh, beyond the point, my personal taste. A curious um, gem material that has amethyst, it's called ametrine. It comes commercially, it's sourced only in one place in the world, in Bolivia, especially in Anaí, which is near the border with Brazil. And it's a special kind of quartz where you have growth sectors with different colors. You have the yellows and you have the uh, purple. And if you cut them properly, like the emerald cut that you see here on your screen, it has, it's a bicolor quartz. And it has been uh, trade named as ametrine, which is quite easy to understand why. You pick up the ma from um, amethyst and trine from citrine, and there you go. It's very, very easy to understand. And it's a lovely, lovely material. But more than cut stones in jewelry, what we see in ametrine is works of art, authentic artistic carvings like this one from Alfred Zimmermann from Ida Oberstein and uh, this from, from Naomi Sarna. And uh, those carvings are absolutely amazing. And if you look up ametrine, especially cut ametrine, you see a lot of creative cuts, not only sculptures, but a lot of creative things. It's uh, those two colors are fantastic to create uh, different things and different color sensations. It's a beautiful material. And yet, as, as I said, it's not hugely expensive. That's why art adds significant value to it. Talking about art, just browsing a few examples of the artistic use of amethyst. Uh, we've, we've talked about Ida Oberstein carvers. Uh, there you go, two more examples. On a 1929 in Van Cleef, a clock, uh, with a nice carving with amethyst, another clock by uh, Bulgari, and a freestyle sculpture carving by Naomi, and special cutting. Those are absolutely crazy cuts, um, adding significant value, artistic value to uh, this lovely gem material. And of course, we have the one and only Wallace Chan. He created his inverted cameo style and it's, uh, he did it in amethyst, so go figure. And of course, when he uses amethyst, it's pretty much like when um, René Lalique used the uh, gem materials. It doesn't matter what material uh, Wallace Chan is using because it's the way that he produces this art piece that matters. He's, in my opinion, Wallace Chan is on the level of the greatest. So like uh, René Lalique, it's um, amazing, doesn't matter what material he uses. And by the way, he used ceramics, he used the titanium. He's crazy in the good sense of the word, creatively crazy. And of course, we talked about René Lalique. There you go, Lalique using, uh, using amethyst. And Cartier, of course, and it's this iconic kind of mixture between yellow, gold, um, turquoise, diamonds, and amethyst all of the same color, uh, notice that it's not easy to get this kind of quality, all of the same color. And Boucheron, Boucheron uh, taking advantage of, uh, the, of the carving of the cabochon and harmonizing it with the ring. And this is absolutely beautiful. And of course, uh, Jean Schlumberger, uh, bird in the rock designs for Tiffany, that most of you might know this design using the Tiffany yellow diamond. But he, this is an example using a fine, fine, fine amethyst. And uh, Joel Arthur Rosenthal jar. And this is not a ring. This is a bracelet using a huge, uh, I think it's a 75 carat uh, amethyst. Nice color, beautiful color. And the Portuguese José Manuel Rosas from Rosior also using amethysts all of the same color in a retro design uh, bracelet. I announced that I would talk about synthetics and quite briefly, because this is not intended to be a technical webinar, but it's important for you to know that synthetic amethyst has been there for decades. Synthetic quartz is known since the end of the 19th century. It has been produced significantly only in the 1940s during the Second World War, 
but amethyst was only entered the market only in the 1970s and since then we see significant quantities of it in the market and when i say significant significant quantities of synthetic quartz in the market it's not complex to separate i mean if you have gemological knowledge and you can get that knowledge studying with the GIA, with GEMA in London, with SSCF, with AIGS in Thailand, with so many schools all around the world. If you know how to use the classical gemologic instruments like the polariscope, you will know how to orientate the sample, look at a certain interference color pattern, and you have clues into the uh, identification. The same with using the uh, microscope, using magnification. Natural amethyst or synthetic amethyst, they have different internal scenarios. If they have anything to be seen under magnification, if there is something, it's different. So you must learn how to look into an amethyst and look into a synthetic amethyst to know the differences. By the way, in synthetic amethyst, occasionally you have those white inclusions that we call breadcrumb inclusions because they look like breadcrumbs but you must have training otherwise you might be looking at dust and you make a wrong uh, assumption so do you know that having instruments gemological instruments whether it is a microscope or a sophisticated digital instrument is like riding a very powerful bike if you don't know how to drive it in the first turn, you go off the road. So you must get education before you use the instruments. It, and um, forget about being, you must really learn not the not the um, not the rules, but the exceptions. Like uh, Doctor House in the, those series, he knew the exceptions. That's why he was so brilliant. Also, again, if you know how to look into an amethyst, you look at the color zoning, and if you have color zoning, you might have some clues. But of course, sometimes you cannot have a conclusion with classical gemology. That's why you must have access to uh, the modern and advanced gemological techniques like the infrared spectroscopy. FTIR stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. And now you can. Uh, you can have access to infrared spectroscope, spectroscope not as expensive as they used to be 30 years ago. But if you know what to look for on a spectra, you can spot a synthetic amethyst like this. And if you can afford an ICPMS, which is laser ablation inductively coupled mass spectroscopy, uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy, it's very difficult to say ICPMS. And if you can afford it, uh, it's quite a few hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can have, you can have access to the uh, composition of the trace elements and isotopes. And of course, with that kind of information, if you have a good database, you can actually uh, have a better uh, source of information to have an opinion over the identification of the material. But uh, Classical gemology sometimes is not conclusive. That's why when you have a, a loop and you have a synthetic amethyst, you look at it and sometimes brrr, you cannot tell. That's why the good gemologists are bold because wow, we do that a lot. Sometimes we, with, with the regular equipment, we cannot have an opinion and we need advanced, um, we need data that is collected in advanced gemological techniques to be able to issue an opinion. That's why uh, to be a gemologist, the first thing that you learn is not that, wow, you know a lot of things, so you are a good gemologist. No. The more you know, the more you are aware of your limitations and know your limits. It's critical uh, to a gemologist. So sometimes you must know how to say, I don't know, I need more information. It's very normal, very simple to say that the same when you go to the doctor, he sends you to a further testing so he can read those results and then he can have an opinion. It's the same. Easier than uh, synthetic amethyst is spotting imitation, especially gloss paste, if you prefer the French pâté de verre 
version of the word, which is paste in English. And paste was quite common uh, in jewelry, particularly in the 19th century. And you, you can come across in antiques a, a whole lot of glass imitating um, amethyst. But if you know how to use a loop, and by the way, this is not a professional loop, but uh, if you know how to use the loop, then you can spot what is important in the, in a glass, which is gas bubbles, the shrill marks, the um, conchoidal fracture, and some more external features that you know that you learn how to look for when you when you get gemological training. That it's not a problem to identify a glass. So, in conclusion, wow, this was fast. This one. In conclusion, we learned that uh, the word amethyst comes from the Greek debatable, but most people advocate it. It comes from the Greek uh, amethystos, that means not drunken. Even if this is not the correct one, I think this is the most, it's the funniest one. So I, I, I stick to this one because it's a lot of fun. It's also an important gemstone that is present in uh, our uh, spiritual um, universe for thousands of years in the Pentateuch, which is means in the in the Torah or in the in the Old Testament in the Bible. Also, there were many beliefs around amethyst, some exoterical, some not exoterical, and it has been the the stone of the bishops. And the uh, occurrences are everywhere, from Brazil to Russia to the Americas to Africa to Asia. I mean, it's a, it's a uh, worldwide occurrence gemstone. And because the value of amethyst is not comparable with the value of diamonds, of sapphires, of emeralds, one of the ways that you can add value to amethyst is through art, through lapidary work, through your uh, jewelry manufacturer, to the excellence of the jewelry manufacturer. So if you have creative high-end manufacturer or uh, art, good lapidary work or a carving or a sculpture, then you add value, significant value to the uh, material. There are some synthetics around, not some, a lot, but gemology can take care of it. So it's not very complicated as it used to be many, many years ago, but you must be aware that they are out there and there are ways of, of uh, separating, especially infrared spectroscopy. That's the most important one. Glass or paste is quite common and you can actually spot it only using your loop. So it's not uh, very complicated if you get the uh, proper training. So before we end, I just want to share with you this lovely geode from Brazil. It was an inspiration for this marvelous hotel project, um, probably in Dubai. I think this is in the Emirates because of the flag that you see over there. And I don't know if the hotel exists or not, but I hopefully it's under construction. And it was, the project was made by NL Architects. And if this, if this is done, I don't mind that you invite me to, not with you, but I mean, uh, all due respect, but you can cover my expenses on this fantastic hotel. And I'm sure it's a lovely JL hotel. Uh, it's a crazy project. I would love to be there one of these days. So. To just to end it up, thank you very much and enjoy this lovely Verdura necklace using amethyst, kunzite, and also trevorite garnets. And wow, it's done. Thank you very much. Young man, take a break, have a drink, relax, rest, recuperate, have some coffee. Don't you have anything stronger than that? Uh, water. Okay. Yeah, you say it's water in there, but we're not sure. Definitely what, of course. People you know, that was wonderful. There's something about watching a presentation which focuses on the color purple. Um, it is a very interesting color in terms of what it does to you. You know, we've been looking at images of, of amethyst now for the past, whatever, 45 minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes. And it's a very impactful color. It creates very strong emotions. You know, it, we, we, we have that association with purple, with, with, with royalty, 
and with rulers going back for years and you can kind of see why because the color does create a certain aura around it um, i hope everybody else enjoyed the wonderful photographs i mean there was there were a lot of comments around some of the photos i think especially people like the bathtub um you know it's yeah it's interesting that bathtub i think they should post a picture of it with somebody inside so you can actually really see the scale of that bathtub because it is a very large piece is, of yeah. art um, um there was a, a discussion that we were having ongoing with diane um and diane had been told in a lecture before that that a gemology lecture that amethyst does not occur in violet only in purple oh that's that's because of my lack of um, english vocabulary that for me violet and purple are the same but maybe for a native it's totally different so it, it, if i call it purple in my mind is violet or the other way around so i'm so sorry it's my lack of good english that maybe gave that uh, that comment which makes total sense because i didn't use the words properly well but it's an interesting discussion and maybe people who are more knowledgeable than us because of course violet is a spectral color one of the colors on the spectrum whereas purple is not it's a combination of red and exactly. blue is what creates purple so the line between purple and violet is actually quite fine um i thought my opinion and i'm very willing to be shot down by the chat box is that amethyst does occur in some purple to violet hues um, I, I would say so yes but uh I wouldn't go into in, into the color terminology in English because I, I would not know the proper words. Well, it, it being a native English speaker, I should know better. But I, I thought it was, but I'm willing to be challenged on this point. And we have a lot of very knowledgeable people. So feel free to add your opinion in the chat box. Also, if people have said before, you know, in lectures, that, that's their opinion and that's fine. It doesn't mean they're wrong necessarily. This is, you know, color science is... There, there are sometimes no fine lines in color science sometimes. And for, for, uh, one of the most interesting things in color and gemstones is where, uh, not uh, has nothing to do with amethyst, is where, where do you separate between a pink sapphire and a ruby? Where is the border? And sometimes it's so hard to tell. And you, you, you must know exactly um, if you are illuminating the stone in different kinds of lightning, you might get different color sensation. And actually, for those of you that photograph amethyst, you know that it's so hard to it's get very... the right color in amethyst. The same with ruby, uh, sorry, the, with emeralds. Emeralds and amethyst are so hard to capture on camera if you want to get the proper color. And uh, when you illuminate, um, you have a color shift, not a color change. Uh, within the same hue, you uh, that, that you 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 have a color shift in amethyst when you illuminate it with incandescent, with daylight or with uh, lead. So they change color. Uh, they change the the very slightly change of hue, um, which is the color. You have a color shift when you have uh, colors on the color wheel that are next to each other. And if, you, if they are not next to each other, then you have a color change. But in, in amethyst, you, can, you, you definitely have a color, uh, color shift within different kinds of lightning. And that's why it's so hard to get it on camera because you must calibrate your camera really well and then do post-production. You must do Photoshop with the stone in front of you. So you make sure that whatever you see on your screen or on your printed paper is whatever you wish to convey. It's very hard. And um, Robert Weldon, for me, one of the best gemstone photographer in the world, he has this, uh, he wants, he explained me in a very simple way how to do it on the Photoshop. It's like five seconds, but I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. It, but he's always willing to share his knowledge and uh, he was quite generous and he told me how to do it. Then uh, I didn't do much photographing anyway but uh, it's simple it's not uh, it's not uh, rocket science are you ready for some questions absolutely shoot elizabeth asks an interesting question here does amethyst contain any inclusions that are diagnostic or highly characteristic 
for any locality? Not that I am aware of. Um, the amethyst can have a lot of inclusions, but I'm not, I, I, I'm not aware of any inclusion that might be characteristic of a certain place or a certain thing. What um, I think today, origin determination, uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure that there is any indications on amethyst, but it's much more with chemical fingerprinting rather than a paragenesis, which is a mixture of minerals together, which is if you have mineral inclusions, you have a paragenesis. So you might expect that this kind of mixture of minerals are characteristic of that geological uh, formation or the other geological formation. But uh, uh, origin determination is challenging. And today, okay, inclusions are important. Um, I'm not aware of any inclusions characteristic of a certain specific um, area or areas for amethyst. Maybe there are, but I'm not aware of. Um, but today, uh, if you want to address origin, you must do chemical fingerprinting. You must do trace element uh, analysis, and you must have reliable databases. And as far as I know, that has been done for ruby, for sapphire, for emerald, for paraiba, tourmalines, uh, I think also for demantoids, because you can have indicators sure. on demantoid that can tell you where they are from, at least from the two rock types that uh, give origin to demantoid, and that's it. And uh, not even for diamond, as you know. But what's the, what's the common factor between all those stones that you mentioned, ruby, sapphire, emerald, paraiba, demantoid? They've all got quite a lot of value associated with them, whereas amethyst, beautiful stone though it is, is not as commercially valuable in the marketplace. So it's very difficult to justify all the expense of the research and the service to do the origin determination. I guess. Yeah, you got a point there, yes. And thank you, um, Lisbeth. Very good question. Joanne Stacker, if that's pronounced right, asks about Rose de France, mm. that lovely term which is associated with lighter colored amethyst. Can you tell us, educate us a little bit more in that? Okay, um, it's usually related to light colored amethyst, but it's interesting that it has always, uh, it has also been used for pink synthetic spinel. Uh, in old literature, sometimes you see Rose de France being used as a descriptive of a pink synthetic spinel, but, at least on the 20th century, I haven't found any mention to Rose de France uh, before the 20th century, uh, has been used as a commercial trade name for light colored amethyst. And uh, that's, that's as much as I know. Uh, I have research on that. I have tried to see the name, if the name is anywhere uh, else uh, behind, uh, before the 20th century and I haven't find any references. So I presume it's a 20th century trade name, but it was also used by for pink spinel, synthetic spinel. Okay, cool. Fatima Vieira asks a question that did come up before again and whenever we're talking about historic jewelry. And she asked, what, what is the foil that's, what, what's it made of, the foil? that's used to back stones in, in old jewelry. And it, this question keeps on coming up because I think people don't understand that it is just aluminium foil. I'm sure if it, if it is the same Fatima that, uh, that I think is Fatima Neto Vieira, is it you Fatima? Say yes if it is you because I know you very well. Uh, she's, she, she's not saying nothing. So Fatima, she's a highly experienced jeweler she works for the uh, Crown Jewelers of Portugal, Leitão Irmão. She's one of the best bench jewelers that I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and she's asking maybe because she's interested in, in knowing how to understand the old techniques. And it was made out of, those foils were made out of silver. And the silver was polished if, if you wanted only a reflective foil bag. But if you wanted color, you used, uh, they used, uh, mostly organic pigments that they would fade over time. So Fatima, it's, uh, they, they were made out of silver, uh, polished silver. Okay. And Fatima, she's not saying who she is, but Fatima Vieira, I only know one, uh, and she's a jeweler, a terrific jeweler. 
Darlene Wong asks an interesting question about whether synthetic amethyst has ever been used for watch movements. Mm. Of course, we know that synthetic corundum um, is used because it is very hard. There you go. Like Bingo. Here. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, scratch. I've never heard of synthetic amethyst being used for watch movements, but I'm prepared to be proven wrong by anybody who knows that they are. Okay. So um, um, quartz has a, a property that's called piezoelectric. And um, as far as I know, I know that quartz, synthetic quartz is used on the mechanisms uh, as, a, as a, an oscillator. So it, uh, it vibrates in the, always with the same frequency. That's why a very small battery can last for a year on a wristwatch. Uh, it's because actually you do, <clears throat> you give some energy to the crystal and then it expands. Then when it expands, it, it releases energy. And so the, the the poor synthetic uh, quartz crystal inside uh, a mechanism, he does like this all the time, always with the same frequency because it has to do with their size. That's why the um, quartz watches, they don't go behind like my watch is a movement one. So I have to, I have to put it uh, back uh, in time occasionally. As far as amethyst, I, I don't know if must, does it make any sense to use those really small crystals that you use on the quartz mechanisms, I don't think so, but I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense because if you want to produce synthetic amethyst, you must produce synthetic quartz with iron and then irradiate it to obtain the, uh, obtain the purple color. So uh, if they are using them in uh, watches, uh, it doesn't make any sense to spend more money irradiating just to put it on a mechanism that is pointless to be a color it or non color it. Okay, thank you. Um, another one from Omer here. He asks, "What causes the color in amethyst?" So, what's the what's the color causing agent? Yeah. Um, the color mechanism. Uh, you you need iron three plus, which is uh, uh, iron with less three electrons on the outer shell. That's that's what iron three plus means. And uh, you need to irradiate. You need that iron three plus upon irradiation turns into iron four plus so it loses one electron and then you have oxygen minus two minus and between oxygen and iron you have what it is called a charge transfer and that tra <coughs> charge transfer absorbs light in the region of the spectrum that uh, results in the color of amethyst Thank you. Uh, there, is, there is a 1988 article by Emmanuel Fritsch in the Gems and Gemology, I think is a part three of a series in Gems and Gemology on the color causes of, uh, um, of, uh, of gemstones. I think he signs the article with George Rossman. I think it's George Rossman and Emmanuel Fritsch. And it's a three part article on the causes of color of, uh, of uh, gemstones, of minerals. And uh, it pretty much says um, that way, this way. And this cause of color is known in amethyst since the 1970s. So it's a very long time that people know. And coincidentally, it was in the 1970s that synthetic amethyst, synthetic quartz that has been made for decades, started to be turned into purple because they figured out how to dope um, synthetic quartz with iron and then irradiated to get the uh, the amethyst color so it's uh, sometimes you, you understand about color mechanisms not because of gemstones but because of other uh, research in uh, material sciences yeah okay excellent um there's a question here that really intrigues me from janet han thank you janet for this question which is Given amethyst is a lower priced gem, why is there so much synthetic produced? Can, can you say it again, sorry? Given that amethyst is a lower priced gem, why is there so much synthetic material produced? Because synthetic material is even lower priced, <laughs> much lower priced. Listen, thank you so much for all those questions from everybody. We tried our best to get through as many as possible. 
And um, I know that, uh, you know, it's dinner time in Portugal. So you must be hungry and you must be thirsty. And uh, if you're ready, I think it's a good time to let people get on with their evenings. What do you think? I think it's perfect. Yes, it's uh, six minutes till 7.30 here. So I still have to cook and to uh, feed my children, my animals. So, um, yes, it's a great, uh, great way of uh, passing me on the floor so I can do some final remarks. Is that it, and Edward? That, that is, but also, you know, I, I think the main takeaway from this, um, this evening is Alana giving us the branding of Geminars. That's beautiful, Thank Alana. Thank you very much, indeed. Yeah. Uh, let's call it a day, Edward. Thank you very much for uh, for your great support. You, I couldn't do this uh, uh, as uh, good as I do without you. In that, in in the other side of uh, of the channel, um, uh, taking care of all the questions and making sure you do a terrific follow up with questions. And you, my friend, you are becoming a professional entertainer, web minerist, and moderator, and co-host. Congratulations, you are doing a great job. And see you, Edward, on Thursday for the Jewelry Voices webinar on traceability. And uh, you, you uh, people out there, if you, if you like the topic, make sure you book. And um, thank you also, Sibjo, for the support. And thank you all uh, for being there for an hour and a half. Um, keeping us company on this home gemology webinar that has been going for months. And uh, see you next week, next Tuesday, for the Biogenic Gem Materials session. So bye-bye, Edward. See you uh, Thursday. And uh, everyone, see you next week. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, Rui. All the best.